Hello everyone, this is my first teaching memo and I always start with a little housekeeping. It appears most of you have watched my welcome video and have sent me your personal email and cell phone number. If you are in the minority and haven't done this yet, please do. Also, if you have not placed a picture as an avatar, which my watch my welcome video and that will show you how to do that. Our first discussion board has ended and I have some suggestions to make. Uh, many of you did not post seven responses. Unfortunately, this will affect your grade. Make sure you get at least five response posts. That's to get the highest uh, grade in that uh, characteristic of quality. Um, also, as the rubric states, you need to share at least one quote-unquote relevant website in one of your eight responses. When you do that, avoid just asking us to check it out, uh, which several of you did. Uh, instead, use it to support an opinion uh, or to enhance the discussion. That way, we'll be more likely to click on it. Um, and also, make sure it's relevant. I mean, some of you added um, links to websites that really had nothing to do with learning targets, assessment for learning, formative assessment. So stay on topic. Um, uh, also avo avoid lengthy research articles. No one, I don't think anyone did that. Um, uh, but avoid those because once we click on it and see that it's got an abstract and it's 25 pages long, we're not going to read it. Uh, even I won't read it unless it's something I'm, I'm really uh, really excites me. Um, what I would recommend are websites like ASCD, uh, NAEYC, which is a, a site for young children, educating young children, Edutopia, the teaching channel, sites like that. Um, that way we'll be more likely to click on it. Those websites usually have very practical advice in them and, and excellent videos. Uh, in my video that corresponds with this menu, I'm going to show you how you can make your link active so we just have to click on it. Not many of you have shared links, but you have to cut and paste it into a web browser. So I'm going to do that right now, and I'm going to do it with, um, oh, there's my teaching memo post. Um, I'm, if you watch me, I'm going to click on edit. You all can edit your posts. I've made that a uh, capability uh, active in all our discussion boards. So if you don't use uh, appropriate APA feedback, um, you can always go in and edit it or if you want to change something. So you'll notice in this in my uh, post here that this uh, lettering or this these words are in blue. That means the post is that means the link is active. You can you can notice the finger when you put the cursor over it, uh, be, uh, the cursor becomes a finger, which means you can click right on it. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to click on edit. And what what you do is you highlight the, the information, what you want to be active. You go up here where this link is. Click on that link and what you will do is you paste your link, cut and paste your link into this box right here. Then you go down to this drop down box. You'll notice where it says the default is open in this window. You don't want that. You want it to open in a different window so it doesn't take you out of a Blackboard. So click on this, open in a new window, click on update, and you will have an active link. So that's something that uh, Hopefully, you all will start using when you share your your web links. Um, <clears throat> make sure you're using proper APA format. I, it's some most of you have been. Most of you obviously have been taught that, but some of you are using improper APA format. Um, click on this link here, the Purdue Owls website, or you can go into uh, Getting Started. And there is a folder on uh, APA in that getting started uh, link. Um, typically, many of you have chose the last night to make uh, many of your posts. Actually, actually I've, I've commented on some of those in this teaching memo. 
Um, one of them was uh, done at 11.40 last night um, with 20, 20 minutes to spare. <laughs> um, uh, this is okay, but uh, you're not giving the majority of, of us a chance to read and respond. And some of the posts I read that were done late were pretty good. <laughs> so uh, try to get those done earlier so we all can have the opportunity to interact with you. Um, several of you have gotten in the habit of cutting and pasting quotes way too much. Um, I would rather have you paraphrase and then cite the text using your own words. I know what the authors wrote. I want to know what's in your head. <laughs> um, this is a characteristic known as cognitive empathy, uh, getting inside your scholars' heads, and it's something that uh, you all should be working on doing and coming up with strategies to do that. Um, I would strongly recommend you try responding to my teaching memos. Only a few in, in the sec 6A section and no one in the 6B attempted to respond to it. You're hurting my feelings. <laughs> the, questions, the question I ask and the articles I share in those teaching memos will take you way beyond what you'll learn without getting involved in them. So please try it. You, you might like it. Um, lastly, I've invited you all to join my EDSE 640 Facebook page so you can keep up with the latest in assessment um, even after um, you've uh, left my course. Um, you can still keep in touch with Dr. Tom and um, I'm always adding, um, you'll see I always, I'm always adding um, appropriate and up-to-date uh, assessment information. So give that a shot. Um, that naturally, that's not mandatory, uh, but I would recommend it. All right, let's talk about session one. Um, I have this quote here from Chapelway et al. Used with skill, assessment can motivate the reluctant, revive the discouraged, and thereby increase, not merely measure, achievement. So the bottom line is assessment can be part of a very powerful part of learning. Um, but many people are so turned off to assessment because of large-scale assessments, the SAT, the GRE, um, all of these tests and, and the feeling that I don't test well, that that's all they think about when they think of assessment. So hopefully you'll have a different outlook after you're done with this course. Um, session one was our introduction to the five keys of quality assessment, which should give you an indication that is not a simple process, one where the teacher goes through the text and picks out questions to ask. You'll see when you create your own test that, that each question has to align with one of your learning targets or objectives so you can see if students have mastered them. Um, many of you understood the difference between summative and formative assessment and mentioned that at SA you are constantly assessing as students are, are in the process of learning. This is important. Unlike in my day when you were taught once and then tested, when the teacher discovered some students had not mastered the material, it was too late to do anything about it, and those students fell further and further behind. A major misconception that I noticed was that many of you felt that formative assessment and assessment for learning were synonymous. We were introduced to the seven steps of assessment for learning, learning which should have given you an indication that it's a process. It's not an event or a one-time activity like exit tickets with almost all of you mentioned. Uh, in one of the discussion threads, many colleagues stated that they practice strategy two of assessment for learning, examining models of strong and weak work by modeling what a good example looks like. This is not exactly what the strategy implies. I shared a video with several colleagues that you can find in additional resources. Uh, I, enti uh, I entitled it Interview with Emily. And you can see it's, uh, it's an interview by Judy Arder, who is one of the authors of our text. And it's an excellent video, not too long, but it really shows you what the process of assessment for learning looks like. So if you haven't done so, check that video out. Um, there are many formative assessments that I placed in additional resources. Many of you have said, oh my goodness, I didn't know there were there was uh, additional resources that we had in every session. Um, I will place additional resources. You can see I've got one session one and session two. 
I'll be adding session three and session four right after I do this video. But in, in there, there are a, a lot of awesome stuff. <laughs> um, especially some of you have, have found um, this 60 formative assessments and 53 checks for understanding. I would highly recommend you download those and try using some of those. Uh, so um, that is uh, my advice for uh, this session. Um, uh, Rebecca in 6A se session uh, found them and mentioned several di different types of exit tickets. Uh, so she was pretty excited about that. Um, there was also an article by Bob Marzano about four ways to use the very popular exit ticket. So it's, it's all worth reading. Um, also, Anne in 6A shared a great website, the, the Teacher Toolkit, um, which contained videos of teachers, um, one in preschool, one in elementary school, and one in high school, which I thought was great, on how they used exit tickets in their class. So uh, be sure to check that out. Many of you mentioned feedback, which is one of the seven strategies of assessment for learning. And the author, authors list five characteristics of assessment of effective feedback, which is on uh, page 31, which you should commit to memory. I believe it is a human tendency to pick out all of the mistakes, uh, but as the first characteristic states, we need to, quote unquote, po be pointing out strengths and offering specific information to guide improvement. Um, I shared this article, which is by Grant Wiggins, who many of you may know, he's very well known, on the seven keys to effective feedback. That's another article I would highly recommend that you look at uh, as you learn to give feedback to your scholars. After reading it, Jessica in 6A remarked that in her kindergarten class, scholars can only handle one piece of feedback at a time, and I would agree with that. Um, I call that too much feedback, or the golf swing theory. If you've ever seen someone play who has just had a lesson where they were given too much information, you know how helpless they are. They're too busy focusing on their grip, their stance, their backswing, etc., etc. They can't even hit the ball. Um, Sophia on 6A made a late but interesting comment after reading the article. She wrote, quote, I think it requires a reframing of our thinking. Feedback is not what happens after the learning is applied. It actually is the learning itself. Very good thought. So remember that formative assessment has been proven to be a powerful strategy to increase student achievement. I've given you the tools for which to experiment. Make it so. It's a quote from Jean-Luc Picard. Some of you may know him. <laughs> okay, on to session two. Uh, this is another quote from Chapaway et al. Students can hit any target they can see that holds still for them. <laughs> um, that's very important uh, because it, it's very uh, powerful when uh, your scholars know their learning targets. <laughs> Uh, session two is very important. Being able to classify learning targets focuses your, your assessments, create your assessment creation, and in turn, your teaching. Uh, I did sense some confusion about disposition targets and behavior. In several groups, I asked about dispositions. Uh, behavior targets appear to be built into the routines uh, set up at Success Academy, so those targets are school-wide. Dispositions are much different. Developing a joy for learning a particular subject. This is a point I continually try to make with math and science teachers. Many elementary teachers that I have taught seem to have an aversion to these subjects, and that aversion can easily be transferred to the students. More recently, I have found the same thing happening with large-scale testing. Teachers who hate it will undoubtedly pass along that distaste to their students, whether consciously or unconsciously, and that is very, very unfair. So you have to be aware of your own dispositions. Um, while dispositions may not be assessed by state ed, they can make a huge difference in the motivational aspect of children for a particular subject. I've shared an article uh, and additional resources by Popham about creating assessments for affect. Uh, there's also an article and additional resources uh, that describes why children's dis disposition should matter to all teachers. And I would recommend highly recommend reading that as well. 
Um, Cynthia and 6B reacted strongly to that article and felt that it was a teacher's job to influence those dis dispositions. I agree. In several groups, I tried to draw attention to the writing of reasoning targets because in the past, almost no one was able to write a reasoning target or create reasoning questions for the selected response test on the EdTPA that you're going to have to do in a few weeks. I asked, I asked why colleagues felt this to be true, uh, and Jose in Group 6A was the only one that took a shot at it and felt it was, as the author stated, because the target does not always contain a reasoning verb. Um, that could be true, and that's what the author stated, but I believe it's because writing knowledge targets and questions is so much easier. It takes a lot less effort and thought. But only time will tell. We'll see how you do. Um, many uh, colleagues wrote that they share learning targets with their scholars by modeling. In response to this, in one group, I listed the following two major misconceptions in regards to sharing learning targets. And this is found in a chapter, which I have in additional resources, session two, um, by Moss and Brookhart. And it's a chapter about leveling the playing field, sharing learning targets and criteria for success. Uh, very well done, and I think you would find it very useful. Um, in it, they, they said, misconception one is informing the students of the learning targets by telling them what it is or by just writing it on the board is sufficient. And the second misconception was just sharing a rubric with students will in ensure they understand the criteria for success. So these are major misconceptions, and I got the feeling that many of you were doing that. Judith in 6A agreed uh, and stated uh, that she is trying to get away from just placing the, goal, the goals on an anchor chart uh, in front of the room. She found that scholars seldom refer to it. Now she finds uh, it is, quote, more authentic and useful tool to review the overarching goals of the unit at the very beginning and then to hold an open discussion about what they hope to accomplish by the end and to what level. This allows us to set whole class goals as well as introduces the idea that all kids should have individual goals for themselves. I like that. In one group I shared a video uh, found in additional resources, session one, in the Prezi presentation on the seven strategies of assessment for learning. Both Nicole and Kelly in section 6b found it very helpful and turning Success Academy learning targets into ones that are student-friendly. Um, also, the authors talk about that in Chapter uh, 3. Um, things that you can, um, I think I have it right here, yes. Uh, on page 69, uh, they give you six, uh, five steps in, to making um, targets more student-friendly. You notice, you notice here they say rewrite the definition as I or we statements, or I'm learning to, I can, we are learning to, or we can. Uh, those are uh, student friendly uh, and make it easier for students to, to get it, wrap their heads around them. So um, I don't have the time or space to include comments from everyone. So each teaching memo I will try to include what I think are the highlights. So I will see you in nine days. <laughs>